Welcome to Build 2, where we go into greater detail because the YouTube algorithm is always a balance of depth and entertainment. And if I go into too much depth, then it won't get shared around the world. And people who actually would be interested in this more detailed content will never see it. So we have that big, fun, entertaining channel. And then for those of you that want it, come here. So when you go to engineering school, because that's I want to educate everybody as to what that would be like if you want to, if you're thinking you want to go do that. You'll have a class called Strength of Materials, and it is all about predicting failure. That's that's what these this whole video was about. I hope you noticed that was you test the material to find out what it will behave like as it fails, and then you can design your parts so that they won't fail or so that they'll fail in a predictable way, uh, in a way that you want it to fail, which is sometimes the case. But when you go take Strength of Materials, the first thing that they will show you is the infamous stress-strain diagram. And typically your stress will be like a sigma up here, and then this will be like a, a delta L over L on the bottom. And they'll tell you that as you load up a material, it behaves in a very linear fashion and then it flattens out and it will then uh, come down here right before it breaks and do something like that or depending on how you look at it, it might go dot 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 and it might break up here i'll talk about those two differences here in a minute this range right here is the like we talked in the video this linear elastic range and so if you're stretching on a spring and you pull it up to here and let go it goes right back to where it started from you pull it all the way here it goes right back to where it started from but if you go past this point called the yield point then and and go up into here somewhere and let go it's actually going to go back down to this point it's now been permanently elongated and you still have an elastic region but the whole thing's been bumped over by how much you you stretched it by so if you stretch it all the way to here and then you let go it's going to go down like this and back up and you're just now you say you've moved that elastic region over. And this whole thing comes from a classic pull test where if you look up stress strain diagrams or tensile samples, you'll see a machined part that is nice, pretty round, small diameter in the middle, and then some way of grabbing onto it, they'll have a couple of different diameters. And there is an accepted profile that you machine these things to. Of course, I, I didn't go with that. I just sort of simulated it. But this way, you're only pulling in one direction. You're not, you're not getting any bending moment in this. That's why they set them up this way. If you wanted to break a stick, what do you do? Do you, do you try pulling it apart? No, you, you bend it over your knee and snap it because you're imparting this bending moment in. But that makes it more complicated for measuring what the material is doing. I see, I don't want to call anybody out, but I see on YouTube some oddly shaped samples that don't look like this, that are uh, maybe a C shape or some maybe looks like a letter or a number. And that's not what we did in engineering school. And I think the reason is because you're, you're now imparting some bending moment in there. You're, you're levering on something, which makes it more complicated. By pulling things straight like this, you're more likely to get really accurate numbers, which is what you're going to get when you look up a material spec. Whatever the material is, if it's a plastic or a metal, you want to know exactly what it's going to do, and this is the most accurate way to do it. The other test that I have actually seen on YouTube is somebody set up what we call the Sharpie impact test, and you'll have this giant pendulum with a big old weight on the end of it and like a blade sticking off, and you'll mount a little block of metal down here at the bottom, and you have this at a very specific height with like a, a gauge up here with a, with a needle on it, and you're, you, you ramp this thing up to zero and you let go and it swings down, breaks the sample. And if it didn't break anything, if there was no energy lost, it would come up to the same height over here and that's how high the needle would go. But because it did do something and some energy was lost, it's not gonna come as high and therefore your gauge is gonna read something less than just this perfect break. And so that, that is an established test. Those were the two tests that we focused on when I was taking material science uh, was this straight pull and the Sharpie impact. 
And so if, if you see people doing tests other than that and coming up with some kind of a score, it's like that's, you know, maybe it's a legitimate test that I haven't heard of, but that's this, this is what we did and this is what I always look for when, uh, when, I, when I'm looking at materials that I'm going to use for a design that I really care about. Now let's talk about this extra little dotted line up here. I guess first we have to talk about what this is. So this is a stress number, which in the video we talked about, okay, I, I first was putting load on this axis. It was just the, the, the force that we were stretching something by. And then I had a gauge, just a dial indicator with the distance across the bottom. And that kept it super simple for a layperson, somebody who doesn't say they're not an engineering student that just loves math. Let's just show them what this behavior looks like. And the graph was really the same either way for what we were doing. But if you want to be able to compare materials, it's important that this is a ratio. It's the load over the area. So you're taking the cross-sectional area of the test area and you're taking the load, divide it by that, and that's where we get our PSI or megapascals on this axis. So as we're getting to the end where this thing is, it's plastically deformed and it's about to fail, if you keep the same area if you, in, your, in your calculation and come down here and break, this is what you get. But you'll notice if you look at pictures of tensile samples online, you'll see that often where it breaks, the diameter has reduced and they call that necking. So as the diameter, it's, it's starting to neck and the diameter reduces, what do you do? Do you keep using the original diameter or do you follow the diameter as it's changing? And I could see cases for both because you want to know what the load is actually going to do, uh, but we're not measuring load, we're measuring force per unit area. And if you were to continually, as this thing is failing, update the area as it's necking down, then all of a sudden your, your denominator of the area is getting smaller, which makes the stress, the, the ratio, go higher. Down here, you'll notice I did not change the numbers. In the, the graph, when I brought in stress, I just added a zero because guess what? This area was one-tenth of a square inch. So if it was one square inch, we would have gotten up to 10,000 pounds, but because it was a tenth of a square inch, we went up to a thousand pounds. And you divide by 0.1 square inches and it adds a zero onto everything. It was kind of kind of neat that way. Down here, nothing changed. Why? Because the overall length that we were dividing by was, guess what? One inch. So the change in L that we were graphing if you go to, well, I need the ratio of the elongation. I'm going to divide by the original length. It's one. What happens when you divide by one? <laughs> nothing changes. So nothing changed. And all I had to do was, was change the label. And I'm sure there were people just screaming going, you can't make a graph with load on the y-axis and elongation or the, the movement on the bottom. is like, well, I did. And guess what? They looked exactly the same <laughs> as I updated it. And that's just... That's what I'm about, is making this stuff simple so that people can understand it. And once you've got your footing, then you can start to add those little, oh, by the way, if we want to be able to compare different materials, then uh, stress is a better uh, unit to use on that axis. And that's what it's about. If we wanted to go, like if this video ends up being super popular, I, I kind of doubt it will, we'll, but we'll see and people want to see, hey, come back and do an aluminum sample, come back and do a copper sample, brass, whatever. Yeah, if I, especially if I was going to put steel on there, I wouldn't want to put a steel sample this diameter. I'd want to turn it down to something half, you know, half that diameter. And then because we're dividing by unit area, even if the force ended up being the same as a, I mean, and I could, if I turn the diameter small enough, I could get the forces to be the same as one of these plastic samples. Uh, but if we're going to divide by the unit area, then, and, and that's the, the dirty little secret here, is how strong those form labs parts were, they would be dwarfed by aluminum, which is considered a pretty soft material. It would be, I mean, I think they, they fail at like 60,000 PSI for like just some run-of-the-mill 6061 aluminum, and it's aircraft grade, but everybody uses it. 
6061 aluminum would be 60,000 PSI, so literally six times stronger than the strongest part that we tested. So even as, as impressive as they were, I mean, that's why your, your hitches and things that are made out of metal can be so small or at the size that they're at, they can do so many thousands of pounds of loads. They have a huge safety factor is because metal is just so impressive compared to plastic. Now, I believe that I still have an issue with my tester because as I look at this slope of this line, we talked about in the video is the elasticity and the way that you calculate it, it's rise over run, just like so many graph things. And the rise is just the over, over a certain length, what was the change in stress and the run was the elongation. And because elongation has no units, this uh, modulus of elasticity here has the same units, the same PSI megapascals as the stress, which is confusing for some people, understandably. But the slope of this line is really important to tell you how the material is going to behave in that elastic region. And as I look at the numbers, I'm getting something like 60% of what Formlab says, like their, their resin was supposed to behave like this. The breaking strength was the same. Yay, that means my load cell's working. But the fact that I'm supposed to get something steeper and I wasn't tells me that, and you, you look in the video up close, and I can just see these things slipping in the jaws a little bit. And it's supposed to be, like I mentioned, this length is supposed to be this one inch. But because I have studs sticking through these holes, my length, I believe my test sample length is actually significantly longer. Hence, I'm getting not as steep of a slope. I'm getting more elongation for the same amount of force because I have a longer sample. And if you look at some testers, what I was used to seeing when I was in engineering school was a strain gauge that would just clamp on at very specific points of your tester so that your machine could be stretching and have slop in it, whatever. You're, as long as the tester is just connected, like it looked like a little set of, uh, like a little compass or something for, for drafting, that it's only holding on to here. So even if you are slipping, it's not going to see any of that. It's only going to see the stretch. But I didn't want to do that way. Do it that way. I didn't want to mess with the extra electronics of taking data and having to graph it. I would have gotten a lot more data points that way. But I also wanted to show people a mechanical gauge moving while this thing was stretching. I think there's. I'm definitely mechanically minded, and when I can see something moving, something stretching, uh, it resonates with me. And then say once something resonates you get your footing then you can come back and say okay well here's the electronic version of that of that gauge and yeah we had an electronic uh, uh, gauge up on top showing the force but hey what are you what are you going to do i did get a hold of for the test i had hoped to put it in the video but the video ended up getting close to 20 minutes and so i didn't include it uh, i did get some additional samples off of a commercial machine from actually a couple of different commercial machines an fdm sample and uh, another it's, it wasn't a uh, not a stereolith machine a different machine but commercial very expensive just to say hey how did it compare with my you know we had our our uh, weaker kind of lower samples towards the bottom and then we had the form lab stuff that was the clear and then the uh, the rigid resin up towards the top and this other the other commercial machine that had the FDM was in the range down towards the bottom there, so kind of kind of what we'd expected. Uh, and then the higher end machine was it they ended up breaking around 7,000 psi. So still couldn't perform as much as the Form Labs machine, which you know for five grand is expensive, but for a small business to get that kind of performance out of a machine that small, it's uh, I'm I'm just even more impressed with what you're able to do with one of those form labs machines but in all of my years of experience pl playing around with 3d prints i don't care what printer i've gotten some parts that were metal printed i've gotten parts that were printed in uh, castable wax you know professionally 
castable wax that then they cast apart for you and sent you that and you could like still see the the 3d print lines from left over from the wax so the printing process was kind of cool but i don't care so far any part that i've seen 3d printed even metal 3d printed it cannot compete with a machined part uh, the even metal 3d printing yes they're really strong but the surface finish is not what you can get off of a machined part. And like, just think of a hole. You're going to have this sandy, gritty kind of surface versus an actual drilled hole. Or, you know, you can't even approach what a reamed hole would do. So often if you need a metal part and you don't want to machine it from billet, then they can 3D print it and go back, put it in a vise and add the really tight features that you need. But now you're trying to grab this often oblong part in a vise, and what do you touch off on? You know, there, there are strategies you can make. You can add extra features for that on the part and cut them off later. But uh, yeah, 3D printing is great because your complexity is free. Once you've started to print the thing, it, the machine doesn't care the complexity. Uh, whereas a machined part, yeah, every bit of complexity does cost you more money, but then you get a machined part when you're done. So there is no, I'm, I'm still waiting for the panacea where it's just snap your fingers and give you the part that you need that's perfectly accurate. And neither machining nor 3D printing has done that yet. So we'll see. And to that end, even the Form Labs machine will leave some residue on there. I've, I've printed some parts that I needed it to be within a thousandth of an inch, you know, really what, that'd be a, a few tenths of a millimeter within nominal size. And the parts weren't because there was residue on internal features or horizontal features when the thing printed that just sat there. And if you just go throw that in the cure station, then it's gonna cure on it and the part is gonna be greater than what we would say maximum material condition. There's more material there than there's supposed to be. So then you start trying to put a peg in the hole and it won't fit. Uh, or you put that part inside of something else and it, and it won't fit because it's too big. So uh, it's what I've seen on the forum labs and other machines is that it's just residue that gets left there from the process. And the only way I've seen to get around it, you know, I can sit there and run it in the isopropyl alcohol all I want. Uh, I have to get in there and scrub it. I've got to get a, a brush, toothbrush, uh, even a drill bit or some kind of a tool. And it comes out pretty easily, but I got to sit there and scrape it off before I go into the cure station if I really want it to hit those real dimensions that, uh, that I modeled in the computer in the first place, which I, which I do. So that's another challenge that I've seen with printers is just getting, uh, consistently getting the accuracy that you need. And I have yet to see anything that's perfect. You'll get one dimension that's perfect and then another one that's undersized and another one slightly oversized. And that's just the, the nature of working in the three-dimensional world. But there you go. That is uh, strength of materials in a nutshell. Uh, hopefully that was useful. Maybe it was a review for someone if you've already been through engineering school or sort of illuminate for you if you're considering engineering or just engineering curious and don't want to spend the, the many thousands of dollars to get it. Hopefully I've given you kind of a window into uh, what engineers do. Maybe if you're working with them, you have an idea of, of what they had the, the gauntlet of schooling to go through to get where they're at. So thanks again so much. This has been a lot of fun and I hope to see you in the next video.